welcome to another episode of Shuali Show, where we discuss education and technology from all over the world. Today, I have with me Mr. Thomas Thompson, the founder and the CEO of EduEd, which is a, an AI-driven platform that helps educators create lesson plans, teaching resources, and assessments. Welcome, Thomas. How are you doing today? I'm well, happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for taking the time and, and for accepting our uh, invitation to the podcast. Um, well, I would like to start with your background. Uh, it's very important to know the background of the founder of a company. So could you please share with us a bit about your journey experiences that led you to founding eduaid.ai? And I, I really hope I'm, I'm pronouncing it right. Mm -hmm. Is it eduaid? Aid? Yes. Yep. Yes. Edu aid. Yep. Bringing together just education and aid assistance, and um, I mean that's pretty much intimately tied with what I do. Still, I'm a classroom teacher. Um, this company started out of my experiences as a classroom teacher, along with my co-founder Thomas Hummel. Uh, we taught across the hall from one another. He was a middle school science teacher. I'm a middle school social studies teacher. And um, we started teaching around the same time and our teaching career coincided with the COVID-19 pandemic. So our first year, uh, we were doing a lot of asynchronous instruction. And then we came back to the school building, but students weren't there yet. We were still teaching online and we had plenty of time to kind of chat with one another between classes. And we had a number of chats. We were on Clubhouse a little bit. That app had its day in the sun for about 15 minutes. and. Um, talking to a lot of people, we got a sense of, you know, not only the problems we were facing, but the problems that many teachers were facing, and not only in the United States, but globally. And one of the main issues was a lack of time to develop lessons, a lack of time to differentiate instruction to meet the unique needs of learners. And around that time, I started graduate school. My focus was on open educational resources, that is freely licensing uh, materials for learning. And I was looking around communities of practice with those resources. Um, and right around the time I'm doing that, Thomas Hummel reached out to me and said, hey, um, I think generative AI might be a pretty cool technology to do some similar things that you're looking to do with open educational resources. And we came together. We brought on a friend, he um, is an engineer, and the three of us together built EduAid AI. That's great. And uh, today, what are your main markets? I know off camera, you, you told me that you're working globally. You're based mm -hmm. in the States, I understand. That so is it's, correct. Uh, it's an American company. Uh, but what is your, are you, are you like, is your market international or more local to start with? And how long have you been? Uh, when, mm -hmm. when did you start exactly? Yes. The company? So we launched EduAid in March of last year, um, and we are a global company. We are working with schools in Southeast Asia, schools in the Middle East, schools in South America. Um, we're working with districts all over the world. Um, we have our scholarship programs. So we're working with um, districts that may have maybe underfunded or under-resourced and bringing EduAid to their teachers at low or no cost. We are working with... Um, just singular teachers as well. So we go direct to teacher with one price point, we go direct to schools as well. So there's a lot of, um, we have a broad mix of different types of teachers that we're working with, different types of school districts that we're working with. That's great. And congratulations on this great yeah. platform. Um, how do you think AI is going to change education? Um, it's it's uh, it's a very interesting question that I, I'm always asking our, our um, guests because the, Opinions are different depending on, on the guest. That's on one side. On the other side as well, there's there seems to be a, a lot of confusion around AI in terms of assessment. Um, here in France and in Europe, for example, many teachers are worried about, uh, you know, they are they don't know how they, they're gonna really properly assess, assess their students uh, mm -hmm. given that they might have access to AI and they might cheat. Could you, could you give us your personal opinion and professional opinion about it? Yeah. Um, so artificial intelligence is already changing schools in interesting ways. Um, there's of course the concerns around cheating. Um, I mean, that's been an ongoing concern that we've had well before AI. 
Um, whether or not those AI detectors actually work, um, from what I've seen, it doesn't seem like they do work with much um, uh, with much regularity. Um, so I'm not sure what solution there is in that regard. However, what we're doing with Eduate is an explicitly teacher-facing platform in that we provide teachers with access to AI tools to integrate the variety of learning materials and resources they may interact with in a day, but put them all on one platform. When you look at it from that angle, you kind of see artificial intelligence as a means of compressing the massive amounts of information that we work with on a daily basis. And that kind of compression piece, I think, is quite important, especially when you look that teachers consider their planning time, especially I, this is a problem that I'm seeing far more maybe in the United States than in other countries where you may have more protracted planning time in some districts. But there's variance, I mean, at a very small level, at a very granular level from school district to school district. We can't extend the amount of time a teacher has in the day, but we can compress the amount of time it takes for them to complete any given task and dramatically lower the cost of exploration of new methods and techniques they may not have previously considered. Those are powerful affordances for AI. However, I think there's also things we need to look at boundary conditions around transparency, around governance, around different frameworks, around copyright. So there's a lot of issues that are still being litigated, a lot of issues that we still need to figure out. But I think there are some clear benefits. And of course, those are having access to a wider range of tools, a wider range of resources that you can bring to students. But there is, of course, the getting over the gap of learning how to use the technology first. So I think professional development is a great place to start. And I don't mean this kind of monolithic one size fits all professional development that teachers just kind of maybe snooze through. We want to look for something that um, is tailored to the needs of that teacher. And I think AI is a great tool to assist us in even doing that. Definitely. And I think it can be a tool to, um, it can be leveraged to personalize mm -hmm. education as well. Yes. Right. Yes. I guess that's what your platform is, is focusing on. Yes. I mean, so there's two schools of thought on this. You can personalize instruction at the student level, or you can give the tools for personalizing to the teacher. And then the teacher who is working with the student and observing the student can personalize instruction using AI. The way you would personalize instruction using AI is, again, I can only really speak for our platform, although there's a few others that do some similar things in this regard. You may have... Um, your traditional assignment that you've always used. It could be at a reading, it could be a um, worksheet, it could be some other task, a discussion of some kind. You can take that assignment and throw it into Eduate. And from there, you can lower the reading level of the text to make it more easily readable to students who are quite at the level at your class, right? So if you teach an eighth grade class and you have a student at a fourth grade reading level, you can now scale the text to meet their needs. And then you have students who are more advanced. So instead of just teaching to the middle and losing the students who are need a little more extra support and students who need a little extra encouragement because they're beyond where the class is, now you can give materials to each groups, to each group of those students, and you can develop materials such that you're no longer just teaching to that middle. You are teaching to each instance of student in your class. And you can do that in the same amount of time that you would have, you know created that single one size fits all material. So there's that kind of personalization. And then there's the intelligent tutor AI learning from the student as they provide responses, as they train on the platform and then tailoring questions to them. Which one is the correct one? I think there's a place for both. I think it's going to depend on the structure of the classroom. I think we're going to see a lot of intelligent tutors coming out. I mean, intelligent tutors is a kind of a whole field in education that goes back quite far, quite beyond um, AI. I mean, there's an intelligent tutor system from Carnegie Mellon University that dates back to the early 2000s. So I certainly see those two veins kind of being the main focus, at least in the early days, in the next, I don't know, midterm, two to three years, we're going to see a lot of work around intelligent tutors and giving teachers the ability to personalize. Exactly, and, and I guess for now, your platform is mainly focused on creating resources and helping teachers to save time. You don't, do you have, um, or are you, do you envision having a, um, an AI tutor 
Christian? Yeah, so um, EduAid is, we've again taken explicitly a teacher focused approach right now. So we're firmly in that first set of personalization where the teacher has the tools necessary to personalize instruction for the students in front of them. The reason why we may not be going or the reason why we are not going into student facing AI yet is I think there's a number of challenges that we need to address and there's a lot of questions that need to be answered before we can give AI to students without the teacher as an intermediary. And I think there's, of course, I mean, hallucinations are a large concern and we can get into how EduAid mitigates those. There's also, of course, misuse. We need robust content moderation guardrails for student facing AI. There's concerns around bias and discrimination in AI systems, right? AI systems perpetuating biases in their training sets. And then there's obviously the privacy concerns, um, what's going on with the data that the AI is collecting, analyzing and storing regarding that student's academic records, performance results, and other potentially sensitive data. And then of course, there's the digital divide, access to the systems. Are we going to have a large gap between students and under-resourced communities that have limited access to the necessary technology to access AI versus the students who have access to the technologies necessary as a prerequisite for accessing the artificial intelligence? We believe that going to the teacher as an intermediary right now can in some way mitigate some of those concerns, but also provide us the avenue for studying the effects of AI in education, specifically from the teacher's point of view. And then once we have the study designs and understand the confounding factors of doing that research, I think we can comfortably start developing for students. But there's a ways to go, I believe. And also a lot of the large AI players, OpenAI, Anthropic, it violates their terms of service for someone under the age of 13 to be using it. So you would need to develop some sort of um, more specialized solution, something a little more bespoke. So there's a lot of questions, I think, that need to be answered before we can safely and ethically bring AI to students. Yeah, yeah, of course, um, it makes sense. Um, speaking of which, you, you mentioned, you just mentioned privacy and data security. Mm -hmm. That is part of the challenge, yes, uh, I guess, that are facing many of uh, many platforms, most of them, I guess. Can you please tell us a bit more about, or can you tell us about uh, any challenges that you may, you and your team may have faced when you created uh, Edu8? I wouldn't say so much challenge as much as it was an initial trade off. We decided very quickly the kind of company we needed to be which was there's no point in collecting data that is not operationally significant. Can we do what we need to do on EduAid while maintaining a very limited data footprint? And we found that we could. So we really collect next to nothing. And I can tell you exactly what it is that we do collect. When a user creates an account, they provide an email address. So we have the email address of the user. And then we have the input that they give for the AI. And that's a topic, an objective, or a standard. So we would know at most the standard that a user using that email address has entered, an objective, a learning objective that that user has entered, or a broad topic that that user is teaching. Outside of that, nothing else is retained or stored or used on Eduate AI. We don't sell any data to third-party providers. We try to be very transparent about this. And uh, that's really been our approach since day one. It's going to be our approach going forward. You don't really need much in the way of background information on the user because the user will be the one who is personalizing the materials to fit their needs, not the other way around. Right. That's that's um, that's very interesting. Do you have? Do you currently have any focus markets or focus languages? Um, yes. Is do you take it only mainly in English, or are you do you have other languages on the platform? Oh, so we have other languages on the platform that comes through um, the AI outputs. The interface of the site itself is in English. However, you are able to set the input output language for the AI. So we have, I think, 18 different languages on Eduate AI. We just added, we're adding one today, I believe. So we'll be up to 19. Um, you'll be able to input in your native language. You'll get the output in the native language as well. Um, and then there's also ways to translate the materials on the site. So if you say, 
are teaching at a school, you English is your native language, you're teaching students who speak Spanish, maybe you want to provide two copies of the material. So they have a side by side view one in English, one in Spanish, you could do that. And you could translate both sides of the material, not just in Spanish, of course, in the 17 other languages that we provide on the site. Yeah, that's the joy of AI. It translates. Yes. Um, do you, as a mission, when you started, do you AIDS, you're, you're in the States, so I guess your main focus, were, were your initial focus, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, were the schools and the teachers in the States, it's where you live. Now, is there, what, what in your opinion, what would be the, maybe I'm wrong, but maybe what is, what would be the hottest markets right now in terms of education that you are probably after the States mm -hmm. might be uh, targeting or thinking about? Yeah, I mean, we started in the States, but our view is always global. I mean, we view education as a public good, foundational human right, something that has global salience, a huge outsized impact on the development of markets in countries all over the world. Um, where we're seeing a lot of growth is in Southeast Asia, specifically in countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam. Um, those are areas with a lot of growth. Um, we're also seeing quite a bit of growth in the Middle East. I'm not sure um, what accounts for it. Um, maybe our way of going about it could be better, but we're not seeing much growth in the European Union. Um, it could be their approach to AI, or perhaps there's a number of guardrails that they have. And I think a maybe slower, more deliberate approach to adopting these technologies may be wise in the long run. But yeah, currently, Southeast Asia, Middle East, outside of the United States, of course, Australia also has quite a bit of growth. Um, they were some of our earliest users. Um, New South Wales Department of Education seems to be taking a proactive approach to adopting AI in the classroom. So yeah, there's a lot of interesting markets, and they all seem to be quite dynamic, especially in the Southeast Asian region. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Europe has been historically conservative about any new technologies and the regulations are heavy. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, we, we, we invented uh, the, the bureaucracy, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. All right, so moving on to the next question that, um, that we'll talk about the future and the future, what do you think uh, we're going to witness in the next couple of years and how that might change edu aid as a platform any idea yeah, yeah i mean uh predictions have a way of making you look foolish in the future so i'm going to kind of temper expectations i think i think there's going to be some foundational questions that will need solved and i think we might get close to some answers on those in the next couple of years and those are around of course governance around security frameworks copyright is a huge issue who owns the outputs um, there's no clear answer there uh, we've taken kind of a deliberate approach thinking about the creative commons attributions license and we can get into a little bit more about what that is and maybe the works yes, being please. in the public domain so a creative commons attributions license is kind of a it's a form of copyright that states that the work can be freely reused, revised, remixed in any regard, even for commercial purposes, just as long as that you give the original creator of the work credit. Simple as that. Um, that may be a proactive way of viewing AI outputs as there isn't a clear ownership stake, right? Um, is it the AI? Is it the company that made the AI? Is it the people whose data went into the training set? Is it the user who prompted it? Right. There's a lot of sticky questions there that we need to get through. Uh, that's going to be quite interesting. Um, of course, as we were getting at earlier, um, if we're making predictions, I really don't see any way around the intelligent tutor question. I mean, those are going to become more ubiquitous as time goes on. Um, as for other predictions, really, I'm not sure. I think having just some guiding principles and understanding some lines you don't want to cross and understanding the questions that you want to answer is probably a good place to begin. So for us, it's you know maintaining clear transparency, understanding how the technology is able to assist you in teaching, right? So being very clear to teachers, 
um, being very clear about what we're developing and why, getting a lot of feedback. So for us, it's going to be a lot of governance systems. How do we mm -hmm. build a system of checks and balances around AI outputs in the classroom? For us, that will look like developing a community in which you're checking the artificial intelligence against the individual intelligence of the teacher, against the collective intelligence of many teachers, revising, remixing, and reusing works. So I'm hoping it's a healthy ecosystem of collaboration between many people, collaboration between person and AI, collaboration between AI and the many people, and then of course the institutional check as well of the school districts having their own policies. And figuring out what that system looks like is a very interesting question and one that we're quite keen on figuring out in the next year or two. That is very interesting what you just mentioned because um, I really think many most of the teachers around the world would need um, crash courses on how, well, would need to understand how AI works and how it can be used in a, in a safe, uh, intelligent way to advance education and to mm -hmm. help their students. And I believe there is currently a lack of uh, understanding or lack of knowledge about AI amongst uh, many teachers. Um, so with, with the with the rapid evolution of AI in, in education, how do you make sure you aid your platform, your team remains uh, remains innovative um, ahead of the curve and in general? How yes. Do you guys do that? So the answer may at first seem counterintuitive. It's um, granularity, right? Small gains made consistently have an outsized effect. So we position ourselves as a model garden. So we have the flexibility to include various types of large language models in our platform through API agreements or what have you. So while you may want to use GPT-4, but you may also want to use Claude 3 Opus or the latest models, the idea is you can go on Eduate and have access to a variety of models each turn to a task that they perform quite well at. That allows us to adopt the most recent innovations in like seeming leaps in technology through the large language model. But really what we're focusing on on the platform are small, small changes, small efficiencies that we're making consistently. We're making sure that we do it right over time so that will feel like a consistent development. And that is that focus mixed with the ability to adopt the latest innovations in different large language model systems allows us to, I think, stay fresh, but more importantly, allows us to build a very strong foundation that will lead to consistent growth over time. And we paired that, of course, with our really low price point to make the system accessible so we can source a lot of feedback from our users to make those small changes because that's the really important part. So really, it's just listening to the customers, listening to the teachers, doing a lot of research on the product, understanding the newest literature, newest research out on teaching methods so that we can implement that into the platform. And we have a general sense of, you know, what works well in the classroom. Um, so it's really just kind of focusing on that mixed with adopting the new large language model developments. And that allows us to, you know, stay apace with innovation. I'm glad you, you, you actually partially answered my next question, which was about, um, you know, some may argue that EduAid and other and other platforms, uh, similar platforms, are merely repackaging technologies of like ChatGPT. Could you please tell us how can EduAid, mm -hmm. you know, differentiate from uh, ChatGPT? You you mentioned yeah. that EduAid is is using different plat different AI platforms at the same time. So you take depending mm -hmm. on on the task, you tap into one or another. Mm -hmm. Why yes. would I go to Edu8 instead of buying a, a subscription on ChatGPT? No, you very well could buy a subscription on ChatGPT, and that will have a lot of you know great effects for you. However, what we do at Edu8 is, I think, quite simple. There's a, it's building a user interface around the technology, right? Being able to access the internet is great, but having a good browser and having abilities to say like bookmark the sites that you like and, you know, develop a reading list or being able to share and connect with your other apps, right? Those are the kind of things that we like. That's why maybe you use Google Chrome over Safari or what have you. 
EduAid kind of puts those similar guardrails, that user interface around generative AI and make it an explicitly education focused technology, categorizing the various forms of prompting most conducive to good teaching and then building an interface that enables you to access that. That's the simple view of what EduAid does. I think we categorize those various prompts at a much larger rate than a teacher may otherwise be able to discover on their own, right? So over 150 different learning resources, the ability to engage a large language model in a chat format, but we also unmoor the AI from that chatbot format. So everything will be structured into a template or into a worksheet or into a reading, and then it is, you know, push through a variety of parameters. And those parameters might look like, you know, learning is mediated by prior knowledge. So all lesson plans must include prior knowledge measures. Deliberate practice and actionable feedback are required for the pursuit of mastery. So we have a feedback bot that will provide a very specific type of feedback report tied to your own personal rubric or um, giving students deliberate practice protocols or you know, working memory is a resource that can be overwhelmed. So developing our prompts in such a way as to chunk the informative text into smaller passages and to break tasks down into their granular steps. And foundational to improving student attainment is to improve teacher efficacy. So developing a lot of measures that may improve teacher efficiency throughout the planning process. That's all baked into the user interface of EduAid that is not present in ChatGPT. So you're missing that education focused bent. And also the constraining of the generative AI within those educational parameters, you don't get that on ChatGPT or Claude either. So it's just specifically focused on the teacher. It's built around the teacher. And that I think is what really sets us apart. And there's a level of granularity and control that you have on EduAid that you don't have in ChatGPT. So when you get an output on EduAid, you can go in on a very fine level and edit the output and add things that you already have, remove things, transform things into something new. And we have tools, we have a suite of personalization tools to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it saves a lot of time as well. Yes. As I mean, future, there's a like lot there. Mm hmm there's a lot there. So we had to take a very deliberate approach to categorizing everything. So it's not overwhelming so that a teacher is no more than say three clicks away from what they need in the classroom. Time's limited. Our resources are limited. So how do we connect you with something you can use as quickly as possible? We remove that learning curve, that friction in using the AI, but it also solves the problem of removing the friction of jumping between 15 to 20 different tabs to plan a single lesson. Exactly. It's, it's a bit like buying an online course or a master class, as opposed mm -hmm. to navigating millions of tutorials, video tutorials on YouTube. So, you know, um, so speaking of teachers, do you have any success stories, uh, do you guys, are you guys seeing the, the fruits of your work away at, at schools and uh, with the teachers that you're working with? Yes. So What's I want to preface, I want to preface that by saying a lot of it, of course, is anecdotal users reaching out to us, providing us with their stories. The I'm a third year teacher. I've been struggling, right? But however, now I'm using Eduate AI and I'm able to do my planning tasks and take less work home. My relationship is better, et cetera, et cetera. We hear a lot of those stories and that is that's quite rewarding, quite heartening, also quite humbling, right? You want to continue to do a good job by these teachers. Um, but I should say that we are now engaging um, various institutions and um, researchers in building these kind of partnerships so we can actually make some serious claims about the effect of using generative AI in planning on teacher outcomes. So that research is still pending. We're just now building those partnerships to get a better sense of that real effect. However, the general feedback from our users has been overwhelmingly positive, specifically around that time saving piece or around the, I didn't have access to this kind of material say it might be a gamification tool that we have on our site or a feedback tool that we have on our site, but now they have access to something they didn't realize they could do before. That is very rewarding. What I also quite like is the kind of feedback around teachers saying, I didn't realize how creative I could be in planning a lesson 
but this has shown me that something I didn't realize was creative is actually quite a creative endeavor. The idea of stacking different resources together and building that sequence of instruction that is just right for your students. And when you hear a teacher doing that, you're like, okay, great. This platform's clicking. The user interface is working. They, they're they able to follow that pathway that we are hoping that they would follow, which is, which is nice to see. There's always room for improvement. So there's things that we're working on around, you know, getting a better sense of how we can scale reading levels up and down, how we can take a text that's meant for like an eighth grade student and bring it down to the level of say a seventh grade student or a sixth grade student. There's a lot of work to do in that and getting that right accurately every single time. Um, and there's some research being done in that area. And I, I'm happy to say that I think we're doing it pretty well right now, but again, always room for improvement. Nice. Um, what do you think sets you apart from other platforms, similar AI mm -hmm. driven platforms? What, what is that? What's the edge? Yes. One is our approach to personally identifiable data. The idea that we want to maintain a very light footprint, I think our transparency and development, but more than that, like the concrete thing that sets us apart is really our user interface. I really don't see other platforms that enable the teacher to work in one place, to have that single station where they're able to do their job. Right. I have a couple of good friends and one of them is a couple of good friends. It's an odd way to um, open this, uh, this anecdote. Um, one of them is a painter and watching him work. I don't see him jumping around his room, going from drawer to drawer to grab what he needs, right? All of his tools are right next to him, open and free to grab. And there's a fluidity to the motion and watching him work is quite inspiring, right? Because he's able to just kind of jump through task switch with no friction whatsoever. Like he's in this state of flow. How can we bring that to the teacher? Because their job is quite disjointed. They're task switching all of the time. And there's a friction in that. EduAid's designed in such a way as to encourage that kind of flow in developing a lesson. So that integration of all the tools on one page, you don't need to click through three different menus. Everything is in one single workstation the whole time and eliminating task switching altogether. That's really, I think, what sets us apart. Um, a, quite a, a lot of platforms, it might be you select the tool that you want to create, takes you to a new page. You type in your title for what you want this thing to be, and then your objective, and then some information about it, and then you generate, and that takes you to another page. And then you can see the um, AI output, and perhaps you want to edit it. Well, that'll take you to another page. And it's like, let's just eliminate that. Let's all work in one space. And that's what really sets Eduate apart, is we have this integrated workspace that is creating subtle efficiencies that add up to outsized gains. And that's great. It's yeah, it's it's about eliminating all this the, the, the fluff and uh, reducing the friction. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like yes. um, I heard once a tip to content creators, and the, the the advice was that you you have everything set up and everything ready for whenever you feel inspired as an artist mm -hmm. to create content. Rather than exactly. just setting up every, every time you're going to record something, setting up, putting a, up the camera and the mic and stuff, they'll have mm -hmm. everything ready. So I guess same online. You mentioned earlier the scholarships, mm -hmm. uh, scholarship program. Could you please mm -hmm. walk us through it? Is it for yeah. for, for whom and what uh, are quite the in, It's quite uh, informal. Um, really yeah. just a teacher sends us an email, says, hey, I really like the product. However financial circumstances are such that I cannot afford to pay for this product for a three month subscription or whatever it may be. And we've granted hundred percent of those requests. Just they reach out to us, let us know they love it. They want to use it, but they can't afford it. And we grant them access to it um, for a set period of time, depending on their needs. And yeah, I mean, that's been quite, quite rewarding. Uh, a lot of our users understand that they're kind of subsidizing the ability for us to do that, covering the generative costs and things like that. And when you pair that with the quite low price point, the idea is, again, to just make this technology as broadly available for the public good as we possibly can. That's great. Well, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to meet with us today. Um, was there anything else that I should have asked you, but I didn't? 
about edu tech edu eight sorry not that i can really think of i think we covered a lot of the main ideas our approach to data privacy our approach to you know what maybe it might be good to mention you know the the big concern around hallucinations and oh yeah you know, bias and things like that uh, it's kind of really i've been repeating this word a lot but i think it is really key to our identity at eduade which is granularity right um the big writer in the ai space uh, ethan Mollick, talks about the jagged edge the jagged crown of ai tasks right it can do some things really well that you might not expect it to do and some things you might expect it to do well that it can't and trying to identify what those tasks are we've developed eduate such that we break down the instructional task to its component parts so instead of generating a test right we don't need to make an entire summative assessment in one resource let's break it down into its component parts multiple choice questions true and false questions essay short answer things like this once you break it down into its tasks and have the ai very focused with a very clear context window and you could do things around retrieval augmented generation where you have reference texts or reference data sets and things around um, fine tuning embedding kind of doing a few shot prompts a few prompt engineering tricks a few things around chain of thought and there's a lot of details there. We can um, build small tools that are going to be largely accurate and then giving teachers that granular control over those small resources to change and edit and revise puts a number of barriers in between a potential hallucination and the end user who's going to be receiving the learning material to students. And again, that's another reason why we've taken that teacher facing approach is to have those deliberate kind of checks in place before the technology gets to the student. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, the methodology of it will get better by the day. Certainly. As, as the technology moves forward. Well, yeah, it'll be less of a concern as time goes on. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, and thank you for taking the time. It was super interesting. Where can we find you, by the way, as uh, Thomas Thompson? Um, I well, we came I came across you guys on LinkedIn. But if a teacher wants to maybe have a conversation with you or uh, purchase your products, where can they find you? So you can go to our site, which is really just our home base for everything. Our blog is there. The links to all of our socials are there, and that is eduate.ai, eduate.ai. And we also, of course, are on Instagram. Uh, X, Facebook, and the rest at Eduade. Right. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you.